Hello, I'm George Malim, the Managing Editor of Vanilla Plus, and welcome to today's webinar. I hope you and your families are all keeping safe and well. Today's topic is how telcos can rebuild trust in communications with rich communication services. The communications industry has had a hard few decades of it. First, the internet offered a new means to communicate. Then, increasing numbers of calls and messages started to come from fraudsters or the just plain annoying, trying to rip you off or sell you stuff you didn't want or need. Over the years, this activity has ramped up to the extent that some users no longer answer their phone to unknown callers or those whose caller IDs are not in their address books. Suspicion of unexpected communication is high. Only last week I found myself checking to see if a text message from my bank was really from my bank. For many, a default position is now mistrust. For legitimate enterprises, this is a serious issue. Think of insurers trying to process claims or medical providers trying to contract, uh, contact pensioners uh, or, page, or patients, and you can see how having to repeatedly call or message costs time and makes customers think the organization is unresponsive. For communication service providers too, this is a big deal. Fewer communications means lower revenues, but it doesn't have to be like this. RCS, which stands for Rich Communication Services, build in verification and authentication capabilities and can drive consumer trust in rich business messaging content. Once consumers have trust in an accessible RCS and relearn to trust what they receive, it will become an increasingly valuable customer engagement platform for businesses. To explain what our RCS can now offer and how it can create the foundation for trusted communications, I'm delighted to welcome today's speakers, Cliff Holsenbeck, the Director of Product Management at iConnective, and Robin Duke Woolley, the Chief Executive of Beecham Research. Before I hand over to them, I should uh, point out that they'll both be staying on after their presentations to take questions from the audience. And uh, to participate, simply enter your question into the panel on your screen, and I'll put it uh, to them later on. Um, we're going to start with a poll uh, to gauge um, audience uh, understanding uh, with the topic. And the poll question has just popped up on your screen, uh, so do feel free to vote. The question is, where are you on your RCS and RBM journey? And the options are very early stage, which means you're just gaining understanding, early stage, which means you're considering um, your approach and strategy, somewhere in the middle, which means you've started deploying technology, advanced, which means you're ex executing a strategic plan, uh, probably in the pilot phase, and finally expert, um, which you could actually be uh, talking on this webinar today. And I'll just wait for the, uh, the voting to settle down a bit. It's interesting, we've got a couple of advanced and expert, uh, uh, a couple of 10%, uh, 11% there. Um, yeah, they could, they could join us in the Q&A. Yeah, hi, Robin. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, and uh, I think the voting has probably settled down. So, Robin, was this what you expected to see? I, I mean, I, I guess the very early stage point is as expected with uh, almost a third uh, of respondents there, but also quite encouragingly, um, over a third have, have said that they're somewhere in the middle and starting to deploy the technology. Yes, um, indeed. Is this expected? Yeah, uh, yes. I, I think it's quite good, actually, that there are some at a very early stage, because uh, I've got a couple of slides in uh, just in case uh, there were some people at a very early stage. Uh, so it's quite good to be uh, proved right in that sense. But, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I won't, uh, I won't delay pr uh, progress any longer, Robin. Um, I'll hand over to you, and uh, thanks very much to the audience for, for voting on that. And uh, uh, Robin Duke Woolley from, from Beach and Resources Research is going to start his uh, presentation uh, now. Great. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, yes, so uh, the uh, telcos can... Uh, yeah, let's move on to this one. Um, so uh, SMS is, uh, is where it's at uh, at the moment. Um, most um, text messaging and um, apps uh, are done through SMS at the moment, but of course it's very dated. Uh, there have been a big increase in uh, messaging apps uh, so uh, over the last uh, few years. Um, so these are some statistics that uh, I've drawn really just to uh, help uh, set the pace. Um, SMS, according to uh, GSMA, in um, 
uh, a survey that they did um, early in 2018. Uh, it's still by far the largest um, use of, uh, of messaging. Um, but um, yeah, the other ones are catching up. But of course, they're all specific to particular uh, applications. Um, so that's the uh, the GSMA uh, chart on on the left. On the right, uh, there's a, a somewhat different one, which is answering the question of uh, which of the following ways do you trust most to receive bills, statements from your bank. Uh, in view of what you just said, George, uh, interesting that uh, you wanted to check uh, whether you know, your last email actually came from your bank or somebody else. Um, uh, I think it's quite interesting that the bank mobile app only scores third. Um, so I wonder about that. Maybe um, maybe that particular banking app wasn't a particularly good one. But uh, nevertheless, MNO uh, text messaging is uh, is second second to email. I have to say that um, I would trust a text message from my bank more than an email, actually. But uh, that's to perhaps just me. But it does indicate that uh, there is a sort of high level, a relatively high level of trust there for a text message from SMS text message, and less for uh, for others. So just to reiterate, on the uh, bottom, uh, the bottom left here, um, RCS uh, is a long overdue replacement for uh, for SMS, um, and the focus in this webinar is on uh, rich business messaging, uh, not peer to peer. So we're looking at the uh, the uh, application to to um, uh, to device application to peer um, uh, part of the part of the market. So what is RCS? For those of you that don't know, obviously we have some experts here, so uh, uh, you could you could answer this just as well as me. Um, but uh, for those of you who are just sort of starting out and just beginning to look at this, there's the um, typical text message that you have on the left, which is uh, SMS-based. Um, you receive uh, uh, communication via uh, literally just a text stream. As opposed to uh, for uh, RCS, uh, you would get uh, something more like on the right-hand side. Um, and uh, that could have all sorts of features in there, sort of branding, uh, rich media, um, and uh, a verified sender, uh, and so forth. And we're going to go through uh, some of those elements uh, as part of this um, discussion. And then typical uh, rich communication service features um, are these ones that are noted on the uh, left-hand side, branding with copy and graphics, video calls, rich media functionality, secure end-to-end -end payments within messaging, high-resolution image sharing, and so forth. Um, and some, of course, are already available on, on messaging apps, and we've become pretty used to them. Uh, but they are on specific messaging apps, so they're quite siloed. It's not across the piece. You can't necessarily have uh, those functions from uh, one sender to one user um, receiver on the other end unless they're using the same app so uh, there are some difficulties so you know RCS offers uh, a single platform for everybody to use um, in common and then we have the opportunity for a carousel uh, so uh, different offers communications from uh, different branded um, vendors uh, and RCR, R RCS um, uh, uh, chat box, so getting a, a, a conversation going. So our, our, our RCS is, is not app-based, uh, so it creates a one-click universal space for um, for everyone. And what's the market look like? Um, well, um, there's a, a few indicators that I've uh, uh, put in here. Uh, so the one on the, the left, which is sourced from uh, Business Insider, has uh, application to peer Growing, so that's the part that uh, RBM is, uh, is 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 in, growing from uh, nine percent in uh, 2018 uh, up to uh, 27 percent in uh, 2014, uh, 2024 rather. Um, so that's growing. That's the blue bit, growing faster than uh, the peer-to-peer uh, -peer part, which is also growing quite quite quickly. So. The opportunity for uh, the business expansion part is uh, is, is pretty substantial, um, and um, those are uh, shown as well by uh, the um, figures from the GSMA uh, below, which 86% uh, of smartphones are RCS enabled uh, by this year, by the end of this year. That's uh, 403 million uh, global monthly active users, according to uh, the GSMA. 
88 operators uh, have launched or will have launched by the end of the year, and uh, 2.7 trillion uh, SMS messages, text mess- uh, business messages sent uh, by uh, 2022, with an estimated $74 billion worth of uh, value uh, of business messaging market by 2021. So we're talking about a very substantial market opportunity uh, and uh, uh, how to make that actually work. Well, one of the big uh, issues uh, that uh, is the main topic for discussion uh, in this webinar is trust. Um, how do you um, um, how do you make sure that uh, the communication that you're receiving is actually from who it says it is? Uh, so picking up on uh, on George's point, there's a lot of fraud around. There's a lot of uh, uh, disbelief. There's a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for things to go astray, for um, accounts to be uh, manipulated, uh, and so forth. And this is uh, illustrated by this uh, finding from uh, Harvard Business Review. Uh, which was an October 2018 survey that they did where uh, verified sender information comes in as uh, second top to being uh, getting the most value from messaging. If we can turn that around, if we can make um, a verified sender um, uh, accurate uh, and people trust it, then the, uh, the chances are much higher that the, uh, this kind of service will be used uh, and then there will be a lot of value that, uh, that can come from that. So um, the next point then is there is a verification process uh, that uh, the GSMA has created, an RCS verification process, uh, which I'm not going to try to explain. Uh, just really uh, by showing that diagram, I'm showing that one exists. Um, but I'm really going to now hand over to, uh, to Cliff from uh, iConnective, who uh, is now going to take us through that detail. Now, iConnective is... Uh, the leading verification authority for uh, RCS. So uh, who better to uh, explain this than, uh, than iConnective themselves? Thanks, so uh, over to you, Cliff. Uh, thanks, Robin. Actually, it's, it's, uh, it's George. Um, we've, we're, we're having a second poll here. Uh, just oh, yes, that's right. Yes. Okay. How we're going before, before Cliff starts. So um, if we can uh, move on to the uh, second poll, the question is, how are you approaching consumer trust in the context of uh, RCS, RBM, so the options are developing and following uh, your own guidelines, looking to regulators for rules to follow, looking to industry groups for best standards and best practices, uh, looking to address uh, the situation with off-the-shelf tools, and uh, it's too early in the process for you to be considering this at the moment. Um, so I'll wait for everyone to vote. But while they're doing that, I uh, should remind everyone that there's uh, an opportunity to put your own questions directly to uh, Robin and uh, Cliff at the uh, end of the event. So uh, uh, please do that. Uh, I'll be pleased to, to pass them on. Um, I think there's still a few people uh, voting. But yeah, it looks very much like uh, industry groups are, are are setting the pace here and uh, um, putting forward um, the way in which this will be done. Uh, Cliff, is is this what you expected to see? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, you know we we already see um, quite a bit from GSMA. We see stuff from uh, MEA up and and CTA, which we'll talk a little bit later on. Um, kind of even our involvement with some of these groups, but. Um, specifically, you know, they, they've already started the cadence of doing so with um, SMS and MMS, the legacy messaging channels, around uh, creating uh, guidelines and best practices. So um, I think we expect to see that trend continue as we move forward with uh, RCS and RBM. Okay, that's great. Um, let's move on. Uh, Cliff, I'll hand over to you now for your presentation. Very good. Uh, appreciate it, uh, Robin and George. I uh, Actually, looking forward to uh, to just speaking with uh, this group today about uh, you know specifically um, building trust um, in RCS. Um, I think it's absolutely critical as we move forward, um, especially in this new and exciting uh, channel. There's a lot of reasons why we want to ensure that trust is built up front, and hopefully, we'll frame up uh, why it's important uh, through this presentation, and then a little bit uh, a flavor of how we go about doing that. So just a little bit about myself. I'm the Senior Director of Product Management for iConnective. Um, I've been involved in the mobile messaging ecosystem um, for uh, probably since 2003, 2004, kind of got my teeth cut around uh, um, 
uh, business consumer messaging around the American Idol text message voting platform. Um, I don't know whether that was fortunate or unfortunate, uh, but uh, there was, uh, it actually got more headlines than a lot of cases, the most national news, at least in the U.S. Um, and uh, so it was uh, kind of a heavy concentration of the power of, uh, of mobile messaging and how consumers you know, view it as an interactive tool. Um, I've got uh, roughly 20 years of experience in, in telecom across multiple things, but mobile messaging has definitely been my focus point. Um, here at iConnective, I'm in, in charge of the trusted communications portfolio, which encompasses um, uh, RCS verified uh, or verification authority, um, us as a verification authority, as well as um, some work we're doing around um, ensuring trust in voice communications as well. And we'll talk about how we fit into that port fit to, to that uh, to the world a little bit later on. But again, the focus of this is just uh, specifically talking about RCS. So um, you know, actually, as I just mentioned, preserving trust in, in all communications is absolutely critical, um, especially when it comes to um, these highly interactive programs such as RCS. Um, I think it's important for us, uh, for the ecosystem to be you know, vigilant um, to ensure that the investment that we're putting into it from a business standpoint, as well as the investment that consumers will make into the process, um, will ensure the future of mobile messaging and make sure it's a vibrant and, um, and relevant uh, communication channel going forward. Um, I think, you know, as we look at it, you know, uh, you know, just kind of understanding the power of RCS, you know, or, you know least initial research around a lot of the pilot programs that RCS has open rates of 85% plus, which is, is pretty amazing. Um, and click through rates around that um, are approaching 40% or more, 40% um, uh, uh, more than what you see in traditional text-based campaigns. Um, and I think, you know, again, as we, as RCS continues to grow, I think this number will go up because people will see it, they'll trust it more. Um, the other thing will happen is, is that uh, it will become more ubiquitous. RCS will be available on more devices. So again, I think these numbers will go up considerably over time. Um, it also is uh, you know, pretty important when we talk about uh, in terms of uh, retention, right? So um, right now what we see is 30%, 32% of all customers, um, um, if they didn't, uh, uh, would actually stop doing business with a brand um, they loved after kind of one bad experience. So it shows kind of the absolute criticality of building trust in this ecosystem and making sure that it stays uh, pristine around uh, the customer experience. Um, uh, and I think that this is a, you know, a paramount concern given the amount of emphasis um, businesses are putting in to A to P um, customer engagement, again, this interactive business consumer messaging. Um, and then lastly, you know, in terms of uh, driving revenue, in 2019, um, approximately roughly 44% of businesses in the U.S. deployed some sort of conversational commerce solution. And um, we expect that, um, you, know, you know, COVID related, uh, you know, um, barriers uh, notwithstanding, um, that, that Gardner actually forecasts that option, adoption to rise um, to 25% by the end of 2020. Um, again, I know that uh, we, we've actually seen where, you know, we've seen some growth in certain areas related to what we're experiencing in terms of the national pandemic or the, the global pandemic currently. And, um, but we, we do, you know, expect to continue to see this, uh, this rise, this adoption rise in conversational commerce over time, and especially as things like RCS um, continues to build momentum. Um, we actually see in the legacy channels growth uh, continuing to go, to, to go forward as well. So with all that being said, you know, how do we actually build trust into this ecosystem? So, um, you know, is really and truly as RCS is a, a well thought out global standards, um, it actually offers us these opportunities to build trust right from the start. Um, for example, in RCS, it's possible for us to do things like validate the enterprise or the entity that's wanting to come in and validate the use cases that they, um, that they want to, uh, to um, or how they want to interact with consumers. Um, and then we can also kind of create these controls around vetted enterprises. Um, and I think, you know, as I mentioned, you know, establishing this trust early on is absolutely key. Um, uh, you know, we expect that 58% uh, that of MNOs are expected to have launched um, an A to P RCS product 
um, in the uh, in, in the coming uh, years, and then it's necessary, um, especially when we talk about the total revenue at state, um, that this is expected to grow to $12 billion over the next four years. So um, the, not only is it going to be um, tremendously valuable you know, for consumers and businesses to interact, but it's going to be valuable for mobile network operators to monetize the assets that they have in their, their ecosystem. And I think that, uh, you know, again, you know, making sure that we protect that with uh, uh, you know, governance and trust is going to be critical to making sure that the long-term success of RCS um, um, continues to yield rewards for us for a long time coming. Uh, let's see. So, you know, I think what we really have to look at um, in terms of understanding, um, especially with the power of RCS, is uh, we have a, a huge responsibility, right? I don't want to um, I'll kind of, uh, you, know, you know, there's a there's saying that with great power comes great responsibility, not to, you know, make a, a Spider-Man quote, but it's absolutely true. And I think the power of RCS, um, kind of by nature of its design, you know, you, you present, as uh, Robin pointed out earlier, there's going to be logos and verification marks and this super polished design, which inherently um, kind of commands um, uh, you know, a trust level along with it. You know, consumers see that and they expect that this is real. And um, I think what we'll see is, uh, Robin also pointed out, that legitimate businesses will demand um, trust by keeping out those who may try to impersonate them. We also know that users will abandon uh, channels based on bad experiences. And I think we don't have to look too much further than, you know, um, RCS's predecessors, especially with SMS and MMS and this legacy channel, that uh, there will be fraud attempts um, to exploit this channel as we go forward. And if you look across the board, just some relative statistics of what happens um, not only in uh, uh, SMS and MMS, but in voice calls, we're, we're currently seeing that uh, you know, consumers globally are receiving roughly 85 uh, billion robocalls a year. Um, people don't trust just to pick up their phone anymore, so therefore they can see something on their device and they're more likely to trust the messaging channel. Um, and then 84% of business survey reported that employees have been targeted for smishing um, exploits by fraudsters as well. Um, service providers are saying that they have roughly 9.4% of A2P SMS revenue is actually lost to fraud, which is a tremendous um, impact to the bottom line. It also, um, uh, you know, it doesn't account for the additional dollars that uh, service providers are spending to try to prevent uh, new messages, uh, th these fraud uh, attempts to be put in place by putting in anti-spam platforms and the like. Um, also, what we see um, is that you know, 34 percent of consumers um, cite trust as the primary reasons for not downloading a specific app, or 56 percent of consumers only trust themselves to manage their data, and especially as uh, you know, consumers, um, especially as RCS uh, evolves and becomes more ubiquitous, we will actually see where this RCS channel actually takes over um, the app experience in a lot of cases because they'll be able to get the same level of functionality in a native messaging um, client with an interactive experience with the brand that, that they want to communicate with. So maybe instead of downloading that bank app uh, application, you know, you're actually talking to the bank via a chat bot through RCS. Um, as I mentioned, you know, uh, you know, more than 85 billion robocalls are made globally each year. Um, and actually, just in America, um, we were inundated with 58 billion robocalls in 2019, plus 4.5 billion of uh, billion spam text messages. So again, uh, the the real issue is is that that you know, as long as there is an effective communications channel, there are going to be fraudsters that look to um, exploit it. Um, and so again, I think you know we we have this tremendous responsibility now, where uh, where we have to protect this 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 new um, exciting and what I think will be an inherently trusted ecosystem out of the gate, just by nature of the way it's presented. So um, I think it's fair to to talk a little bit about um, you know taking maybe taking a step back and just understand how we got to where we're at. And I think any time you look at uh, you know, how businesses um, have uh, communicated with consumers in mass, you can kind of look no further than the evolution of technology and the devices that run across that uh, technology. 
So really since communications has hit mass scale, governments, uh, businesses, uh, NGOs have all looked for like uh, effective ways to communicate with uh, those that want access to information or access to products and services. And in kind of like section one of this chart, you'll see um, where there's been a logical network evolution over time, right? So we started with radio and TV early on, um, then came along, you know, uh, circuit switch networks and cellular circuit switch networks that introduced things like data services, um, uh, you know, uh, in really simplistic terms like paging and then, you know, SMS. And eventually we get to IP networks. And within those IP networks, we have um, these sophisticated IMS um, implementations. And I won't go into the intricacies of the, the technical side of things, but really with this glow, growing complexities, coupled with you know um enhanced speeds of the network you know if you remember like in the early days and you had like a feature phone like a flip phone and and you're trying to read the news on it it took a while to pull things down um those were the early 1x evdo networks and now we're, we've gotten all the way to these 5g networks with just blistering speeds uh for uh you know ingesting and downloading uh content but it's really opened up the door to these new possibilities that, that are being created around um interactivity and messaging and then kind of in parallel with the networks evolving, we, we see the devices become more and more complex, you know, allowing for, you know, on-demand services. You know, uh, I can remember early on in, in, in my career, we talked a lot about like three-screen convergence, and it's actually happened, you know, between, you know, our tablets, our television, um, and our, you know, laptops and, and things of the like. We're actually seeing um, in our phones, we're seeing, uh, you know, that I can move from one place in, to the next watching TV and then maybe interact with, um, certain um, content that's coming, uh, you know, across these devices, and I think the interactivity is the the uh, has created this apex for us around uh, conversational commerce. And I kind of threw in this last little bubble out here because it's something that's actually pretty interesting to me. And I think, you know, uh, I think we'll actually see RCS and interactivity and being able to converse via, you know, AI. Um, it will play its way into the virtual reality market as, as well. You know, being able to, you know, especially now that we're all at home, we're all kind of learning to shop in different ways and the like. And there may be, you know, at some point that you actually walk through a store in virtual reality and buy things and interact with potentially a bot. But I'm, I'm looking at a lot of the technologies coming out around RCS and uh, these chat bots and thinking how does that play its way into the next generation of things as well. But in section two, we see how, you know, kind of the communication complexity changes um, as these device uh, capabilities grow in parallel with it. Um, and so the net, as we've come a long way from kind of like these one-way broadcast communications, like with radio and television, right? And um, we've now gotten to a place where simple response via traditional messaging, you know, text, you know, back, you know, the letter, you know, the number one for yes, and number two for no, we've gotten actually gotten to a place where the simple AI and more complex AI, things like machine learning is making its way um, to mobile messaging and into rich business messaging um, is this kind of the solution behind the B2C RCS, right? Is now that these things are making their way into this technology, we're, we're actually approaching a place where emotion and other contextual clues will influence chatbots, how they convert, converse with us. And, and kind of simply put, um, conversational commerce is becoming so customized that users will expect that they're actually talking to a person, um, that they're not, not talking to a bot. And while this is very exciting from you know, uh, a, a commerce perspective, it also is absolutely critical that when you do that, that there's inherent trust that sits behind it. Because when you feel like you're talking to a person, you actually are more likely to trust that this person is working on your behalf. And especially as they interact in you in the same way that a human would, you would feel that that's on the other side of it. So the ability to collect user information or fraudsters to be able to exploit something like this is pretty high, um, especially given the, the complexity of, of what's being deployed. So let's talk a little bit about how does content actually become trusted, and then we'll talk a little bit about, we'll get into more of, of you know, what we're doing um, in RCS to make sure that this trust ecosystem is intact out of the gate. Um, you know, first, you know, in any uh, uh, trust ecosystem, there's, there's governance. This is kind of the rules of the road is established by those who um, administrate an ecosystem. Um, it can be comprised of regulatory, industry guidelines, industry associations, like we you know, took the poll earlier, um, you know, kind of creating, um, you know, uh, again, I would say the rules of the road on how we, we should interact uh, or the content should be curated. 
Um, next is, is monitoring, like putting in um, either systematic or um, uh, uh, mechanisms that would review content to verify it conforms to the governance structure. Is it, are, are those who are um, perpetuating content, are they doing it in the right way? Does it you know, follow um, you know, either the rules of the, 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 the uh, regulator is set, you know, an industry association through guidelines and things of that nature, or maybe even a mobile network operator set for how the traffic they want to see come across their network? Um, and then actually presentation plays a huge uh, part in how content becomes trusted. As I mentioned, RCS uh, inherently, because it's a sleek user, you know, uh, user interface, it has things like logos and trust marks, all of these things that would, um, that would present itself to the user. I mean, if you kind of think about it, um, you know, I'm more, if I go to a website and it, and it doesn't look like it's put together very well, I'm less likely to believe in what I'm reading than if it's something that has, actually has, uh, you know, a, a good uh, look and feel to it. And you see quite a, a amount, even, uh, you know, with you know, the things that you see in social media, the more polished content is, um, even if it's, you know, like the fake news that, that we hear a lot about, right, it, when it's well put together, people are more likely to believe it. So presentation is absolutely key. Um, and making sure that content is trusted. And then the medium, you know, where or what platform is the content originating on? Am I more likely to trust them, you know, a message via my native messaging client um, versus uh, an email, right? Um, if it, and I think you know, even Robin was saying that, you know, he's more likely to trust if it comes across text message than email. And this is a great example of that. When you, how is this uh, content being uh, presented to the user? And lastly, who is actually the presenter? You know, if it tells me it's State Farm or Wells Fargo up front, um, uh, or if it's even like, you know, in, in, in television, if it's commercial or product coming over a legitimate network, you know, like a, you know, one that we're familiar with, like Fox, for example, or NBC or ABC, then am I more likely to trust it or the BBC? Um, am I more likely to trust it when I see it on, you know, one of these mediums that uh, are, are uh, that, that I know that it's gone through some curation process based on who's presenting it? So all of these factors ultimately influence uh, uh, trust, but when it really boils down to it, adoption of any content is uh, actually uh, most directly influenced by the experience that we have with that content or the experience of others. And, and that's kind of like a continuous loop. We're hearing what our friends say about something, um, and we're, we're definitely giving up our opinions on you know, our experience with a particular piece of content or medium. Um, and, it, and it, you know, it's pretty simple. If it's good, we gain adoption, and if it's bad, there's uh, abandonment uh, for, the, for the channel or the content. Um, and, I, and again, I, I, I can't stress that enough, that we have to um, ensure that the content that's created in RCS is, is trusted, um, and then again, our, our experience will drive, drive whether or not we actually utilize it. So I, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but but you know ultimately you know brands want to know um, when we talk about building trust in RCS, brands want to know if they're actually talking to the right customer, and customers want to know if they're actually talking to a legitimate brand. And because there's so much value value in the messaging channel, and specifically the value that'll be built in RCS um, and its interactivity. Um, fraudsters are going to want access to this channel for spamming, spoofing, phishing, um, because there's economic advantage in it for them. You know, it's very it takes a very small percentage of take rate um, when a fraudster gets access to you know one of these channels today in order for them to to gain significant financial gain or information gain um, uh, for those that they're trying to exploit. And the the, the the crazy thing is all these same technological advancement that we talked about earlier are leading to fraudsters adopting these same technologies for nefarious activity. Um, so, you know, you know, conversational commerce, you know, building a chat bot that can fish for someone's information. Um, again, they will, they will look to utilize the same technologies that are essentially being built for good to do um, you know, basically evil. So um, we really have to utilize all protecting me mechanisms at our disposal to ensure that, that, that trust is actually built within RCS out of the gate. Um, uh, and and there are really kind of uh, two different ways that trust is, is comprised of, right? So um, trust is built out of utilizing indirect means such as anti-spam and spoofing solutions, you know, network solutions for traditional networks. 
And this is kind of like what we refer to as implicit trust, right? So I don't actually, as the user, see all of these mechanisms that are in place on the back end to prevent you know, fraudsters um, from gaining access to me. Um, so again, we, we kind of just say that's an indirect you know, trust mechanism. And um, where we kind of focus, or at least I connect to focus, is, um, or a verification authority um, is focused around is building direct trust or explicit trust. Um, and ultimately, you know, we have to you, uh, go through identification and registration of entities in order to do that before they're ac given access to the ecosystem. And then once they're verified um, and, um, and, and kind of been sent through the paces and you know, we create digital signatures and the like for them, then um, we can uh, give them attributes such as they're, you know, allowing them to show their logo or a trust mark to say that they've been through this process. Um, and this is, again, at the core of what an RCS verification authority does. It actually starts to build that explicit trust so that the user knows that, again, it's coming from all of those things that we talked about um, earlier. It has some level of governance assigned to it, monitoring, um, you know, the medium is good, you know, the, the, the packaging, the, the, the way it's presented um, is being done in the right way. So, again, we've, we've kind of looked at those things and said, you know, now you can be trusted in this ecosystem. So um, just very briefly, you know, um, the way that iConnective um, views um, trust, in, it should be viewed um, from a holistic approach. So while we are very, you know, focused on RCS and um, rich business messaging as a part of, uh, of, of this particular webinar, um, there are influences that has on actual A to P messaging. There's influences it has for the voice world and even in the app world as well, where um, you know, there, you know, there are brands or enterprises that want to get access to multiple, you know, let's say OTT applications as well. Um, but in this, this world, right, so we have an enterprise um, who wants access to these uh, shared resources amongst multiple service providers or mobile network operators. And typically, they have an agent who is actually working on behalf of that enterprise as well. In this case, what we typically see is we see uh, application providers or aggregators that uh, that are working on behalf of an enterprise who may actually be registering um, um, through the verification authority a particular entity. And we expect this to be a majority of the cases, but we may actually see instances where an enterprise wants to register directly as well. But in every case, they really have to go through this um, entity verification process. So let's just talk a little bit about um, what an RCS verification authority is and does. And these, uh, you know, the, the red um, lines you see here are basically rows are kind of like how it almost goes through um, uh, from a process perspective. Um, but ultimately, every uh, RCS verific verification authority, in our opinion, needs to be neutral um, and trusted. Um, the authority will basically go through the process of independent, independently verifying the entities um, and their intent upon entering the ecosystem. Um, it's also critical that um, we verify the individuals who represent their companies. Um, do these individuals actually have the authorization to act on behalf of the entities they represent? We check things like logos and service marks um, to give some level of confidence that the logo belongs to the entity. Um, and this is very critical when logos can change over time or be altered, let's just say, for seasonal initiatives, right? So you have a uh, Tesco, uh, you know, brand who at Christmas time puts a Santa hat logo on it. Does that logo actually still match up and be close enough to the actual Tesco logo that it's not some fraudster who's, who's looking to gain uh, the confidence of users by, you know, again, altering it in some small way? Um, we actually want to register... Um, the chatbot is a part of the universal profile specifications, um, including additional metadata for legacy SMS uh, and MMS fallback. Um, we utilize the information that we gather to create a digital signature um, via Java Web Token or JWT. We pass this information along to the RBM platforms or the MNOs or some you know, collective uh, RBM platform represented by the MNOs. And then ultimately, uh, you know, kind of lastly, we, we actually provide uh, you know, some sort of workflow management system for all the bots that uh, are in network or in process. 
Um, this allows you know, uh, for the MNO or the submitter to be able to go through the process of you know where is where is my chat bot um, in the you know the process has it been approved is there something that I need to do um, with this bot in order to make sure that it gets approved so again kind of this whole workflow management system that sits around this process is absolutely critical. So. Um, how iConnective um, is restoring trust in communications and specifically, you know, again, we talk about it in terms of the omni-channel, but specifically for RCS, um, you know, we have a, a platform called TrueReach Intel. Um, it's a SaaS-based uh, offering for voice, text, and, you know, obviously RCS chatbot verifications. Um, the platform allows for the entity verification we talked about, a simple workflow to manage that chatbot registration administration, um, and then kind of this interactive GUI um, uh, that's pretty intuitive and, and includes a comprehensive set of APIs to integrate with messaging providers and MNOs, um, really kind of all ecosystem participants um, for the implementation of their chatbots. So we uh, uh, we actually have quite a few um, ongoing chatbot and RCS related uh, deployments um, relative to, to being a verification authority. Um, we were recently named uh, verification, one of only two verification authorities in the GCMA RCS ecosystem. And then as a part of other initiatives, we were working very closely, as I mentioned earlier, with the industry associations such as uh, the MEF to educate and re refine um, the Verification Authority Initiative, a Verified Sender Initiative. Um, we also uh, are a member of CTA, and obviously we, uh, if many may or may not know, we run the registry for common short codes in the U.S., and we work with many of the companies in our ecosystem already um, to make sure that uh, from an industry perspective, this is a better place to do business. Um, and you know, specifically with service providers, we're um, working with quite a few in the U.S., um, uh, uh, either individually, collectively, and as well as a lot of the European mobile network operators on you know, pilots on RCS uh, verification and deployments, including the use of the TrueReach Intel platform that we were talking about earlier. Um, and then ultimately, uh, as well with uh, technology partners, um, whether it be application providers, aggregators, um, other data service providers in order to you know, learn as much uh, as we can about the entities that want access um, to this ecosystem. Um, but there are a lot of joint developed initiatives, initiatives that are underway um, relative to this program. So it, it kind of is, uh, in some cases, it, it can, you know, uh, it's really the right time to be looking at how you're going to do verification um, in RCS. Um, there's really... Uh, it's, it almost runs in parallel with your deployment of uh, RCS or RBM in your network if you're a service provider and if you're an application provider um, or an aggregator, you, you, you likely want to, to, to be um, kind of getting engaged up front to understand how you would inter integrate and make sure that verification is happening as you submit bots into the ecosystem. So uh, just a little bit here of... Uh, 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 shameless promotion. Um, so why iConnective? Um, we've been in the telecom and numbering space for over 30 years. We, we actually have a, um, a deep-rooted knowledge not only of what happens at the industry uh, level, um, but you know, we're very uh, close to telecom legislation and regulatory, um, as well as the business applicability of, uh, of uh, you know, these initiatives as they get rolled out. Um, we've been the industry thought leader on the number of solutions. Um, we understand you know, probably the number of landscape better than anyone and uh, the technology necessary to make those things a reality. Um, again, but whether it be industry knowledge or, or our position as a trusted neutral third party um, for many cross, uh, for global cross MNO and service provider initiatives, um, you know, you know, I think we're well positioned um, globally to be the, a trusted verification authority um, for this ecosystem. Um, we take part in countless forums, um, again, these initiatives, and we, we ultimately we pride ourselves in the ability to create uh, simple, seamless, and secure solutions, really no matter what. And I think, I think as we roll out RCS 
um, verification of uh, verified sender um, via verification authorities globally, no matter which one you select. Um, there's going to be variations in, in how uh, you interact with the verification authority. So again, it's not too early to get into the mix of uh, understanding what needs to be done um, or where those integration points could actually take place. And just to, to kind of conclude um, this part of the, the, the webinar, um, there's additional information, um, including our, our uh, white paper around achieving trusted communications engagement that you can get for free via our website. Um, you can also you know, feel free to contact us through the website as well um, if you have any questions or want to learn more about TrueReach Intel or what we're doing as a verification authority, or maybe there's some other the channels, including voice and the other things we we were uh, recently selected as the STI um, policy administrator for stir shaken in the U.S., which is um, a big part of stopping robocalls um, within the U.S. and uh, other initiatives that we're working on around voice as well. So if you got any questions around any of the things we're doing around building trust and communications, not just RCS, then feel free to reach out. And with that, Robin, I will turn it back to you, see if there's any questions or comments. I think it goes back to George. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Robin. Uh, thanks, Cliff. That was great. Um, we had uh, quite a few questions in, so that's great. Um, I'll try and get through as many as possible in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, Robin, um, the first question I'll put to you, what do you see as the relationship between geographies and trust models? Um, are cross-border solutions possible, or do you see different systems emerging uh, country by country, for example? Well, Cliff, it's probably better to uh, address this directly, but uh, but I would say that there are cultural differences between uh, different uh, regions, and uh, that might uh, get in the way of uh, having uh, uh, systems that are uh, cross, uh, cross region. But, uh, but maybe uh, Cliff can uh, give us a bit more detail on that. Yeah, I think cohesion at uh, some level amongst operators, um, definitely cross geographies will be important. Um, whether um, that be you know kind of like multiple verification authorities working in unison, um, connected by a common governance authority, or maybe even database, or um, or whether that be a, a centralized VA for a geography, um, cohesion will have to be present at some level. Um, I think we may see where regulatory bodies um, even uh, demand some sort of influence across geographies. Um, at a minimum, we're probably going to see MNOs uh, talking about it from probably like a country level. Um, but it may also be region, regional, for example, like if, if you know, in the EU, um, they may demand something, you know, something be done together. There may be some sort of regulation that comes across that influences at least um, how, uh, what needs to be verified and how that verification needs to, uh, to be reported. Um, again, I, my hope is, is that we're able to, uh, amongst the industry associations and industry governance, that we would create some sort of you know, rules of the road, as I mentioned earlier, um, around how this works, and we can all uh, adhere to it without having to get too much regulatory involved because it becomes you know, a little bit more complex when that happens. Um, but again, I think it will be important to have cross-industry visibility to see where problems or problem senders may exist. Um, otherwise, we'll get these silos of verification authorities and um, you know, it'll be up. Kind of the burden will be on the MNO um, at that point to identify where you know again things like again someone who maybe is impersonating a brand who already has a chatbot registered but exists. So again, I think that that we'll at least probably see it at a country level. We could see it at a re regional level. There's also things like language, you know, even within a region, there could be different languages at play and things of that nature. So the complexity will grow as you, know, you expand out of a country, but uh, I definitely see it as something that there will be co cohesion, at least at you know, country region level. Okay, so uh, moving on, um, Cliff, um, what does a verified business look to a consumer and how would this be different uh, to an unverified business? Yeah, I think um, think about that. So, you know, simply put, a verified business will will carry a trust mark of some sort. Um, you know, I, I think you know, anytime that you're you know putting a logo on something um, that that you're uh, uh, you know, again putting that trust mark or you're um, 
allowing this rich content to come across. You're going to want it to be trusted. So I think actually MNOs will take the posture that only verified bots will be allowed into the RBM platform. Um, and more importantly, the, the MNOs uh, will actually propagate a chat, what they call a chatbot search directory. Um, think about this as like your phone book for all the bots that are available for you to speak to. So you may have Delta Airlines and, and uh, you know, Virgin Atlantic Airlines and those types of things, and you would search for Virgin if you wanted to, you know, this person to application methodology. And I don't believe that any MNO would allow you to be put into that search directory without you having gone through the verification process. Okay, excellent. Um, I think this is probably another one for Cliff, but Robin might have something to add too. Uh, the question is, what is the GSMA RCS Verified Sender Program? And I guess we just want to get some more detail on, on that. Sure, I, 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 can, I can take that. Um, yeah. I don't know whether Robin is coming off of you there, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Go, go ahead, Robin. If you, if no, no, no. I was, I was, I was leaving it home to you actually, because uh, I, I put that little <laughs> diagram up just before uh, we turned over to you, and then we had that poll. But uh, that was really for you yeah. to uh, get into the detail of in your thing. Yeah, our, our RCS verified sender um, very simply is the deployment of um, the, the RCS sender verification program through a verification authority. Um, it, it's the, basically the guidelines on how you know you should deploy um, and realize the concepts that are in the universal profile specification that's been put out by GSMA. Um, you can actually uh, actually what sender verification at its core does is make sure that you know the attributes, for example, like logos um, <clears throat> and names and those types of things that are associated with a chatbot actually match the, the party that is authorized to use that. Uh, information and you know I think there's probably the if you want to learn <clears throat> a lot more about verified sender and, and some of those things you could uh, pr probably the best resource I would think is just go to the GSMA website I think under future networks um, you can either search or it'll be listed there uh, you know I think they have a pretty pretty comprehensive white paper around uh, verified sender okay and if, you, if you really are interested you can actually read through the, the universal profile uh, specification um, it's a, a little bit uh, deeper level of reading. <laughs> Great. Um, next question. Um, the question that's coming is, uh, how do MNOs solve uh, the lack of client interoperability? Um, is that a big issue, Cliff? Um, I, I think it currently is. I mean, I, I, it, this actually is uh, more of a, a question outside of necessarily trust, even though there's implications to trust to it. Um, there, there's probably some other experts that could probably even talk even at a deeper level than I could on this call, uh, given a couple of the responses we saw earlier. But um, this is the, the kind of a, a, uh, a topic that has come up across you know, getting RCS uh, to scale, uh, which is you know, device, uh, how do we put it? Uh, one, one, we are working through the process of making sure that we get device ubiquity. In other words, uh, today, RCS is uh, currently available mostly on Android devices. Um, some legacy Android devices it's not uh, compliant on. But then secondarily to that, um, or actually related to that as well, um, you know, we're, we're actively, um, uh, I guess, hoping for Apple to join into the uh, RCS, at least the rich business messaging ecosystem at some point, um, even though they've, indicated, they've not indicated any um, direct intention to do so at this time. But specifically back to the to the uh, client interoperability, um, it is a secondary issue to just getting, uh, 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 I guess, you know, a, a client onto the device in general. Um, and I would say that you know, I think as time progresses, you'll see um, the MNOs, you know, uh, forcing the uh, handset manufacturers as well as um, those that are that are you know. Uh, you know, propagating you know, RCS as a global standard is to start utilizing a standard client so that they can in turn um, reap the rewards of the revenues that would come along. I think we got to make sure the MNOs are kind of all singing that same from that same song sheet as we move along as well. Is that we need a standardized client that has the same feature sets um, across you know globally. 
Um, I think one of the big issues is, is that when you lack certain feature sets or certain things are available on certain devices versus others, it makes it very difficult for an enterprise at that point to, to kind of count on the user experience that they're looking to, uh, to add to their marketing budget, right? And uh, I think this will be critical going forward. But, but again, it is uh, a known uh, obstacle that we have to overcome to, to kind of achieve this you know, nirvana of RCS being a global adopted and ubiquitous standard. Great, thanks. Um, I guess now we've got the, the $64 billion question, um, which is uh, how do you make money from RCS? Uh, Robin, do you, do you, I appreciate it's a very wide um, question, but uh, do you have any uh, tips that you could pass on? Uh, well, again, I think this is really one for Cliff because he, uh, he's looked at it uh, in, uh, in detail. Uh, but clearly, uh, there are uh, numerous ways of uh, making uh, money out of the, uh, even the, the, the text-based uh, system uh, at the moment. And uh, the, uh, the opportunities look very broad for uh, customization and uh, for uh, uh, personalized services that uh, I think people will value. I mean, uh, we've talked about uh, trust, but once there is trust, um, then there's heaps of uh, value that, that, that can be applied in uh, uh, direct conversations, direct communications with uh, individuals which they will value because they'll get something quickly. Uh, whereas if they go through the sort of traditional you know, answer service uh, through, um, through people, it takes, a, it takes a long time. So I think, uh, and then we, we couple that with uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. I think that... Uh, there is uh, a great deal of opportunity to uh, add value in uh, innovative ways and uh, and develop uh, things that really couldn't be done uh, any other way. So uh, I think that the uh, the route is open to a very uh, you know, potentially very innovative um, future in uh, in new uh, facilities, uh, but we do have to get the trust issue right first. Sure, uh, Cliff. Yeah. Same question. Where's the money? Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's. Uh, I think uh, as as RCS rolls out, it's going to become, in my opinion, it will become maybe one of the number one ways that uh, businesses are looking to shift their uh, digital dollars um, and spend. So we have to first ask ourselves, where's the money? You know, who's who's asking the question, right? Is it at the enterprise or is it? the folks that sit in the middle in this ecosystem um, who are looking to make money off of uh, you know, providing RCS as a service um, to, to, the, to the enterprises that maybe they're serving today from a traditional messaging standpoint. But let me, let me take it up to a macro level, which is um, when we look at where dollars are being spent today and the shift from brick and mortar um, buying to online shopping, um, you, know, you see what happens with Amazon. You go through, you present it with a lot of options. You can specifically search for what you're looking for. RCS is going to give us that same opportunity with um, this interactivity and AI experience where, you know, if you're looking for you know, a, a pair of you know, white Nike trainers um, that I can type white, you know, I could, I could directly engage with uh, Nike I can say, show me all the pictures, you know, sh show me all of your available white Nike trainers, and it brings up a carousel with all the Nike, you know, maybe five or six recommendations. And then based on how the ones that I select that I want to look at more, maybe I, there's some that have a black swoosh on it. So now I'm presented with more options with a black swoosh. And so I think uh, from an enterprise perspective or, or a, a, a marketing perspective, the, the level of interactivity that will come because RCS is available, it's in your native messaging client, they're going to look at it and go, this is a tremendous opportunity. And we're going to see, especially as ubiquity and it becomes at scale, massive amounts of dollars being spent on this channel, one. And then two is that the from if you're in the middle of this ecosystem, you are going to be able to, um, and you are, you're selling RCS services, um, especially with the take rates that we saw on the open rates that, that we saw earlier in the presentation, it was 85% um, open rates on RCS, is that when those, you know, this, you know, uh, when you're presented with these options and this interactivity, um, that, that 
or, or enterprises presented with this level of interactivity, that they're going to spend those dollars with uh, the folks who are actually starting to, to lay the groundwork today to pr provide these services um, outside of the ecosystem. And then it's just as a pure communications channel, I think that there's opportunity cost that will also um, influence this as well. Is that like uh, I have this rich way in which I can communicate, even for things like uh, you know, notifications and alerts, you know, did you know where we mark safe, for example, during a, you know a natural disaster? To be able to do that through my my native messaging client um, would be uh, would be pretty profound. Great, excellent. Thank you, Cliff. I'm afraid we're we're out of time. So many thanks to today's speakers, Robin Duke Woolley from Beach and Research, and uh, Cliff Holsenbeck from iConnective. Hopefully, Great. this webinar has helped us all get a handle on how trust in communications can be rebuilt in the RCS and RBM era. Thanks also to the audience for attending today. Uh, we hope you all keep safe and well and enjoy the rest of um, your day. Uh, thank you and goodbye.